Hello and welcome to One North Main, Brockton's magazine show where we profile people, places, and events that make this city, our city, great. I'm your host, Jay Miller, and for the next half hour, we'll be discussing and learning about Frederick Douglass. Happy birthday to Mr. Douglass. It's his 200th birthday, and as usual, Brockton is doing it in style. We're featuring two events today and two locations. The first one is at Frederick Douglass Academy over my right shoulder. It's an event that celebrated not only Mr. Douglas, but great black American heroes. And here at City Hall for a Frederick Douglass display put together by the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association, Lynn Smith, and a couple of guests that she invited to talk about all things great related to the display. So I want you to sit back, I want you to relax, and I want you to see what your community, the City of Champions, has to offer. Mr. Sproles' class, Mr. Branco's class, for the awesome work that you did exploring stories that are often hidden from history. You know, Black History Month is a celebration, and we really want our event today to be very, very celebratory, just in terms of, you know, these are stories of people that you don't often see. You don't see them in the history books. You might not see them in the news, but in their way, they've all contributed something in the arts, in the sciences, in sports, and in music. So while well, the most impressive thing for me while I was watching you all put this together was how much you all helped each other pull this off and pull this together. And you did this you know, in a way that showed that you, know, you cared not only about the subject, but that you cared about each other and helped each other get these things done. What do you like about this event? Man, this event, you know, I'm really feeling it. There's a lot of energy everywhere. If you look around, you know, come follow me over here, bro. You just see the energy all over the place, you feel me? So, like, we got projects everywhere. Everyone's been active on the thing. Everyone got it done. That's what's up. So everyone got their A-pluses, you feel me? So, like, you know, we got, we got Tupac over here and all that. So I'm feeling it. Everyone getting their A's and all that. You know, students trying to keep their grade up. I'm happy about that. So today's his birthday. Um, they called him Valentine. Valentine, today was his birthday. It's actually his 200th anniversary today. So yeah, um, this is where he lived, the, like the, the Maryland plantation. And um, yeah, so this was, I did the Maryland like when he was younger and how he like someone taught him how to like, write in ABCs, but it was forbidden. So um, he had to run away because his, his master beat him every day. So eventually he ran away, and then he went to Baltimore, went up. So yeah, this is his mother right here. He raised him. My name is Alexis Crawford Robinson. I did Aretha Franklin, Aretha Louise Franklin. Growing up, she was the fourth out of five children. She had a mother, which was Barbara Siggers, a gospel singer, and a reverend father, which was C.L. Franklin, a.k.a. Clarence LaVon Franklin. Um, her early career, she signed to JBB Records at 14 years old. <clears throat> Once she turned 14, her father started managing her. Um, he started bringing her on tour with his gospel groups. He called those tours, but they really wasn't really tours. But on the road, she was exposed to many adult behaviors. So at 14, she had her first child. Two years following prior to that, at 16, she had her second child. She took a year off 
Then with her father's permission, she went on to New York to pursue her career. She's got 18 Grammy winning awards under her belt. She started singing at 1956. First she was a gospel singer, then she crossed over to the blues and pop territory following Sam Cooke and Cl Clara Ward and Diana Washington. This is my boy, my favorite quote on her is that I sing to the realest, the people who tell it like it is, who know it like it is. So, is Why'd you pick boy. her? I picked her because I'm a rapper myself and she's an icon, she's a musical symbol and she's, her title is literally the Queen of Soul. So her being the Queen of Soul and she, her getting that because the Civil Rights Movement, she was a symbol of empowerment, I thought she's at the top of the list. Out of all the women singers that are icons, she's at the top of the list, you know? So I was like, I gotta I got do her, I gotta capture her. She had the pipes. There's around 216 total pictures on the, this board, both black and white in color. Took a lot of ink. <laughs> My name is Corey, and the person I chose for my Black History Month project is Jack Johnson. I specifically chose Jack Johnson because I feel me and him are similar and alike. We like a lot of the same stuff, and I kind of feel like me and him are connected in a way. And especially with considering both of our love for boxing, so I thought he would be the perfect person for me to do. His legacy that he left inspires me to go harder in my boxing that I do now and helping me get back up on my feet helping me start up again. Jack Johnson was the first African American world um, heavyweight champion in boxing and since he was going up against all white opponents uh, they didn't really want him that, like he wasn't supposed to be as rich as he was. He wasn't supposed to be able to beat all of their white fighters. They wanted to find somebody to beat him because he would always have the nicest cars. Okay, the nicest students, clothes. at this point, you he would have white women with him in okay. those cars, Stand by and they didn't board. want him to have to that. Questions. They didn't like that he had that, so they tried to bring him down, but. Every fighter that they brought to him, he ended up defeating and kept that championship title. Welcome to Brockton City Hall and to our display honoring Frederick Douglass on the 200th anniversary of his birth in 1818. Brockton is a multicultural city, and our display highlights the connections Mr. Douglas has to many of our citizens. What better location to host our Douglas Bicentennial display than this amazing building filled with priceless paintings that depict the Civil War? To share more of this story, we are honored to have with us Willie Wilson, local Brocktonian, teacher, historian, and our city tour guide and Mr. Bob Martin, our City Hall historian. This display, first of all, features Frederick Douglass, who is uh, uh, one of the most famous of uh, our Americans, African American, and we're celebrating the bicentennial. Uh, as uh, some of you know, he had four children, and the oldest was born in New Bedford in, uh, in 1840. Uh, but here at this display, we're showing his uh, evolution as a speaker and an orator. And uh, it's been said that he has been one of the most photographed men of the, uh, of the 20th century. And uh, we do have pictures of him uh, from paint to portraiture. But here uh, we talk about the Douglas legacy. He lived in New Bedford. He also lived in Salem for, for a time before the move to Rochester. Uh, one of the things that are lesser known about him is he visited Worcester. Uh, in the 1840s and actually spoke against uh, the discrimination of women and uh, he was one of the first males nationally to speak up for women's rights and the right to vote for women. Uh, 
Again, he, uh, he passed away uh, February 20th, 1895 at his home in Anacosta, uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, again, I think it, just looking at him, you, could, you have an idea of his stature. I talked about his involvement in women's suffrage and on how he um, helped and like how he supported and what he did for their community and stuff like that. Um, today is his like 180th anniversary of his escape from being a slave. What's one thing you learned about him that you didn't know before he started? That he was even involved in women's suffrage. Like I didn't even know that was like even a thing. That he did. When we connected Frederick Douglass to the women of Brockton, also known as North Bridgewater back in the day, we could not leave out his relationship with Susan B. Anthony and the women's suffrage movement. And the beautiful portrait of Susan B. Anthony that you see in back of us was done by a local woman artist, Susie Shaw. So I'm going to ask Willie to talk a little bit about Frederick Douglass and the women's movement back in the 1840s. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Frederick Douglass did address the women's issue in the 1840s at a speech in Worcester. But I have here a quote from a, a speech he made um, in December of 1866. And uh, he was very familiar with and worked with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as well as Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott. And Lucretia Mott was one of the individuals that actually visited along with Frederick Douglass at the Liberty Tree on High Street, which is now Frederick Douglass Avenue. This is the quote, and this is what he said. Women and the colored man are loyal, patriotic, property-holding, tax-paying, liberty-loving citizens. And we cannot believe that sex or complexion should be any ground for civil or political degradation. In our government, one half of the citizens are disfranchised by their sex and about one eighth by their color of the skin. And thus a large majority have no voice in enacting or executing the laws that, are, that they are taxed to support and compelled to obey. With the same fidelity as the more favored class who usurped pr pr uh, prerogative, it is to rule. A little wordy, but again, showing his passion uh, and again, they were very good friends and supporters. And you know, Willie, I'm going to jump in too because we know one of the very last official acts that Frederick Douglass did was to give a speech in 1895 to a group of women activists and he went home to his house that evening and either had a stroke or a heart attack and passed away. So from the beginning to the end, he was supportive of women and the women's right to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Satchel Page, um, why did you pick him for this event? Um, he just he just kind of gave everyone uh, just a look at what someone can do of how like no matter what they go through as a struggle, Com coming from the Negro leagues and then going to that pro baseball career as the youngest rookie ever in the MLB and the oldest player to ever retire in the MLB and it's just unbelievable what someone can do and has such a great story going from a troubled school to just being one of the greatest pitchers of all time. If he played his whole career with the MLB it wouldn't be called the Cy Young Trophy, it would be the Satchel Page Award for the best pitcher ever. What is the biggest similarity between Satchel Page and Frederick Douglass, if there is one specific one? He, he pushed everyone, he kind of, he, he wanted to, he wanted to, he, he really wanted to show that no matter what color, no matter what race you are, you can do something important. I did Dorothy Danbridge. She was uh, an entertainer, an actress, and singer in the early, well, early 20s and late 60s. Basically, when she was alive, her mother was really obsessed with the entertainment industry, and she wanted her daughters to shine and be famous. So she established the band The Wonder Children, which she later named the Danbridge Sisters. Early on in Dorothy's life, she was forced to participate in shows and different type of, you know, 
different type of entertainment, you know, atmosphere. And that's what pushed her to become an actress. And that's when she started to realize that's what she really wanted to do with her life. Dorothy had a lot of struggles, though. She was unable to obtain an, a role that fit her as an actress. And that basically means that when, as an African-American woman, she wasn't able to get a role that wasn't basically a maid or someone who was a mistress. So she didn't work for years because of it. But because of the movies that she did do, she ended up um, getting the first, becoming the first African-American woman to get an Academy Award for Best Actress. for approximately 37 years, and Lynn is correct, I'm sort of a historian, not only of City Hall, but a love of Brockton history. Um, we're standing in, in, a, in a facility that has had its ups and downs, obviously, but um, one of the most notable parts about the City Hall is the fact that it's history again. And let me share with you a little bit about <coughs> uh, City Hall's history in itself. Uh, City Hall was built um, between 1892 and 1894, after three different uh, uh, voting initiatives uh, finally made it with a cost of $368,000. And that's including the paintings, by the way. Um, City Hall is approximately 92 feet high. It's still used as a, the center of municipal government. And today we're going to share a little bit about not only the significance of City Hall, but the relevance with Frederick Douglass. The painting I want to talk about that's related to uh, what I think is one of the most important, obviously important parts of Brock North Bridgewater's history, Brockton's history, is the spirit of 1861. Um, I don't know if you can capture this with the lighting, but in, the, in this portrait, which is very, very profound, you have a runaway slave that's by the fireplace, or by, a fi uh, but not fireplace, I'm sorry, but by a campsite. His arm is reaching into the air to the light of freedom. The light of freedom is, is exemplified by the angel Gabriel. If you notice, on, on, if it, if you notice the, uh, on top there, angel Gabriel. And then on, on the upper right hand corner is uh, the Grand Army of the Republic. It's kind of obscure, but I would have preferred, as I said, to Lynn to have at least one or two civilians in that corner who played a significant role in the Underground Railway. On the other side of the painting uh, is the archetypical look of the, uh, the slave hunters, there were two gentlemen and, and some ferocious looking dogs. Uh, in North Bridgewater, however, they, there wasn't two gentlemen with ferocious looking dogs. There were these obsequious individuals with handcuffs that actually were, were running around, not running around, but uh, looking for the runaway slaves uh, all the way down as far as I know to South Carolina. But in North Bridgewater was also a scene of where people were informing when the underground, um, sorry, on the Underground Railway and, and the, the uh, slaves that, that were um, transported all the way up to, up to Canada. So this is, a, this is painted uh, as a reason, a main reason, why Brockton or North Bridgewater at the time had that significance of being one of the points of the Underground Railway. It wasn't without controversy, however. They actually wanted a number of paintings, this one in particular, not to be painted and have another military um, military painting, but this shows how the significance is of, of the, the abolition movement at the time. Tell me a little about a little bit about Henry Armstrong right here. Well, you know my man Henry Armstrong. He was in 181 fights. Knocked on 151 of them. Feel me? You know, mm -hmm. he's a small dude. He's five five. But he pack a punch. Feel me? So you know, out of 15 kids, he's 11 child. He grew. He grew up. He was born in Mississippi, Columbia. Mississippi. You feel me? He's an 11 child, 15. Mm -hmm. You know, he started boxing at 14 years old. Boxing at 14? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's 5'5". What, uh, what weight class? Oh, he was in four different weight classes. He had three titles for three, three different divisions. You know I mean? He's in lightweight, featherweight, welterweight, okay. and lightweight. You know what I mean? So, okay, you know, my man's belted around. He's beating everyone up. You know what I mean? So, you know, 
you know, he's next to my man's Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. He's Mike Tyson. Right. He's doing Mike Tyson. He has an old man next to Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Okay. You see him knocking people out right here. Over there. Okay. Knocking more people out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wasn't a very big man in all. Oh, I see. I see. Five five. Five five. 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 That's my height. That's, yes. that's my height too. And he went to four different divisions. Yes. Wow, that's crazy. Nice. And just, but when he was doing it, bro, you gotta listen. Dude. He won the title for one, right? Mm -hmm. Bro, moved up two week, two weight classes. Moved okay. up two weight classes, Ooh. right? And won the title for that too. At the height of five five. Five five. Five five. That's crazy. The whole time. Five five. That's crazy. <laughs> Hi, my name is James Wenners, and I did the project on Tupac Shakur, a poet, an actor, and a rapper. Why would you do Tupac? Because he has a lot of history, and he, um, because the project is about relating him to Mr. Um, Frederick Douglass's quote, if there are no struggles, there is no progress. And I did it to him because he had a lot of struggles, but his struggles came out to be progress. I like his music, I like his movies, I just like him in general. When he grew up, he was poor, but when he started like, uh, when he started moving around a lot, he started to act and do movies and rap, and he started getting a lot of money. And then now he made, he made a lot of movies, made a lot of rap songs to help people, like Keep Your Head Up, and he, helped, he really changed the world. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and flows downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to climb the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. But his wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful chill of things unknown but long for still, and his time is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade rains soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but long for still, and his time is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. She on TV too. Hair. <laughs> she, on hey. <laughs> she created a hair product that like helped her hair out because she had like a lot of stress and her hair began to fall out. Because like her family did pass away from yellow fever. So she ended up moving in with her sister and that's when like she began to like create her product. So she she created it and then many people like were wondering how her hair grew. So she just made like a product for them to use in their hair and she sold it and she was like the first millionaire. So wait, she grow, she created a hair growth product? Yeah. So was she the first to do that? Yeah. I'm going to read to you Harlem by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust over and sugar over? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? He was included in the Harlem Renaissance and he helped the Negroes to have a voice so they could be heard. And he died of prosperous cancer in May 22, 1967. He's 65 years old. He wrote many books and poems. And that's how computers were invented, because he was the first one to do the typewriter. Brockton has a very large population of Cape Verdeans, many recent immigrants. But interestingly, when Frederick Douglass ran away and settled in New Bedford, the black shipmakers that he met in New Bedford on the wharves were most likely the first free black men that he had ever met, and they were Cape Verdean shipbuilders. And this amazing portrait that you see in back of me was done by a local artist, Daji Andrade, of a very iconic freedom fighter of Cape Verde, um, Amilcar Cabral. 
So we know that when Frederick Douglass was living in New Bedford, he started to formulate more of his thoughts about abolitions and about slavery, and really took a lot of comfort and inspiration from those free black men. So I'll turn it over to Willie to talk more about his early years. Uh, in his early years, as Lynn had mentioned, uh, Frederick Douglass was uh, befriended by many Cape Verdeans. Uh, most of them uh, were free, as Lynn had mentioned. Uh, their passports and papers of identification mentioned Portuguese uh, ancestry because uh, Cape Verde was not yet independent. It didn't achieve its independence until 1975. Uh, one of the places that uh, his first great speech uh, by, uh, on uh, liberation and anti-slavery and abolitionism was in Nantucket. William Lloyd Garrison actually recruited him to work for his organization. And so they featured uh, many articles and speeches by Frederick Douglass in that then newspaper called The Liberator. And Nantucket was, uh, was a hotbed of abolitionism uh, at that time. And so uh, we, on the island of, N of Nantucket as well, there were many uh, Cape Verdean whalers and shipmen and rope makers. And so we have here uh, what we did in the Strive to Freedom exhibit in the presentation and seminar we gave some years ago was tie in together the facets, uh, multifaceted information and connections that Frederick Douglass had concerning freedom for all uh, different ethnic groups as well as women. We have a very large population in Brockton of proud Haitian Americans and so we had a local artist, the same gentleman who did the portrait of Daniel O'Connell, do this amazing portrait that highlights um, Haiti's iconic civil rights figure, Toussaint Louverture. Many people don't know that Frederick Douglass served as minister to Hades towards his, uh, the end of his life. And actually, he was invited to give the keynote opening speech at the World's Fair, the World's Exposition, in 1893 at the Haiti Pavilion. And so Willie is going to talk a little bit about Douglas and his service and the connection to Toussaint Louverture. Um, as we know, Frederick Douglass was a champion for, uh, he was an abolitionist, he was a lecturer, he was a statesman, he held many different um, positions during his lifetime. And, uh, and he was Consul General for Haiti. Uh, and uh, this particular painting is, is, is just remarkable, the detail. But it also speaks to some of the things he wrote about. Uh, Haiti was the first independent um, uh, nation of color in 1804. And he, during his lifetime, felt that it needed to be respected as other individual white nations, and, uh, and he fought for that vigorously. Frederick Douglass Avenue was named that in 2004 because our Liberty Tree, a sycamore planted in 1763, had to be taken down. So the name of the street was changed to honor Mr. Douglas, but interestingly, where that stump was left in the ground, a brand new sycamore sapling rose up and is now healthy and happy on Frederick Douglass Avenue. And that location is very important to us because that sycamore tree was the visual clue, the visual signpost that nearby was a stop of the Underground Railroad in Brockton. So we hope you've enjoyed this tour of Brockton City Hall and of our Frederick Douglass Bicentennial display. We want to all invite you all to a very special event that we are hosting. It's on April 12th, that's a Thursday night at 7 o'clock, and we have world-renowned actor, author, historian Charles Everett Pace who's going to come to our Brockton War Memorial Auditorium and give his one-man show about Frederick Douglass. Well, there you have it, Brockton. Another one North Main in the books. Thanks for watching. We hope you learned a lot about Frederick Douglass and his role here in our fair city. If you want to learn more about Brockton Community Access, and if you want to learn more about Frederick Douglass, check out our YouTube page, youtube.com backslash the Brockton channels, all one word. For everyone at One North Main, including executive producer Mark Lindy and producer Aaron Tebow, I'm Jay Miller. 
and we'll see you around town. Walk in Jerusalem, walk in Jerusalem, walk in Jerusalem, Jerusalem.